Hello everyone. In chapter 19, we're going to be talking about the way that manufacturing firms of a certain type use a costing system called job order costing to keep track of their flow of inventory costs. There are different types of cost accounting systems and what makes them different is the particulars. It's the small things, but overall they all do the same thing. They measure, they record, and they report product costs, which are your inventoryable costs, your direct materials, labor, and overhead for the period. And they help break it down on the whole, you know, this is what we incurred in total product costs, but also to the unit level. This is what each unit we manufacture costs us. And having that information helps managers in a ton of different ways. It lets them know which products are the most profitable, therefore they should produce those. It helps them set their sales prices to make sure there's a certain level of profit margin on each product that they sell. It determines how many products that they should produce it helps them come up with a cost of goods sold when they budget for their income statement and it helps them come up with the cost of all their different three types of inventory raw materials whip and finished goods when they're coming up with their budgeted balance sheet the system that we're going to be focusing on in this chapter is called job order costing and job order costing is used by companies which produce specialized or unique products so they're not mass manufacturing just millions of the same exact product they specialize in making essentially custom things. So building a house would be an example. Or if you're making custom text for a specific course at MVCC, assuming we're the only college that uses that, that's a very custom job. And they would use this job order costing system to track what are our inventoryable product costs during the period that go into this job. So we know what level to report inventory at uh, for you know whip and finished goods and also what level to expense when we actually sell the job to the customer that ordered it uh, at the end of the period. This is different from the other system of inventory costing which is called process costing and process costing is used by companies that just mass produce a ton of the same exact identical units so iPhone making iPhone 10s or 11s or whatever version you wish to have they make millions of those things there's nothing special about one from the other and when they make them they don't make them all at once like they don't sit down and say I'm going to make this iPhone and only this iPhone they produce batches of hundreds if not thousands at a time in stages of production it's an assembly line they go step by step by step same thing true with textbooks if it's not a custom textbook for a college but instead a mass-produced textbook that they sell to hundreds of different colleges they don't go through they don't make one book they do it in an order uh, and that is what process costing is it's essentially the accumulation of costs as they go through the various different stages of production a lot of the America's largest companies would use process costing because all of the you know apples Google's Ford's whatever company you wish to have big major players they all produce goods that are identical in large quantities but job order costing is more specific to say a local area small business and in this chapter I'm going to focus exclusively on job order costing but I want you to know that it's only used by that one specific type of company uh, it's not used by every company in America some companies their business model makes it so they want to use process costing because it makes more sense. So what we're going to do with job order costing is prepare this document called a job cost record. Each and every job that your company undertakes is going to keep a separate job cost record for that job. And in the job cost record, what do we do? We track the three different cost components of production. So we track our direct materials and our direct labor and our manufacturing overhead. And doing so helps us figure out what the total cost of the job is. And if it's making more than one unit at once, we can also figure out what the unit cost of the job is. And this job cost record, again, allows us to keep our books. Whenever we want to know what our WIP is, we have a record for that job. Is it still a work in process? If yes, then the total cost of that job up to that point goes into WIP. Is it a finished good that hasn't been sold yet well if so you go look at the total cost of that job from its job cost record and that amount goes into finished goods inventory is it a job that we completed and sold during the period well you would look up the job cost record and know that that particular job's cost should be recorded as an expense now under cost of goods sold because we can only expense the cost of production once we actually sell the products that we make and in this that's what happens with a cost flow of inventory? 
Say a company has three jobs going at once, and I have job 27, 28, and 29 here. Well, all of the cost components, the materials, labor, and overhead that go into each job are going to go into WIP, and it's going to be for the respective um, job. So each job is going to have its own job cost record. Job 27, 28, and 29 are going to have their own job cost record, which keep track of their costs. And if one of those jobs happens not to be completed when the period ends, like in this case, job 29, that balance stays in WIP. If it's finished, you transfer it off to finish goods inventory. So it's always your next step. If you have a work in process that's done, it's no longer in process, it's finished, you need to transfer all of the costs to finish good inventory. So you would go and you would see the job 27 and 28 are done. It should be in finished goods. Well, did you sell those? Well, in this case, they sold job 27, which means they get to expense it. So only job 28 stays in finished goods, while job 27's cost gets to be recorded as a cost of goods sold. So the job cost record is great. It's a convenient way of, you know, keeping track of what the costs were that you went into each job. But in accounting, that's not enough documentation to have a job cost record. We keep records always starting with the first step, which is to record the journal entry. So let's talk about the journal entries that we have for materials. Well, what would we do with materials in regards to production? We have to buy them in the first place. So we would purchase raw direct materials, or maybe some raw indirect materials. We would have them sitting around in storage to be used later. Well, you would have to book that at the time that it happens. And then you're going to use those materials in production. So if those materials are used in production, your direct materials go right into the cost of their respective job. And you would put that on the books in a journal entry. If you have indirect materials, again, which are materials that are used by several different jobs at once, but you can't directly trace to the job, well, that would go into your manufacturing overhead. And again, uh, companies don't want to run out of materials. Like you don't go and sit down and say, you know, we're going to use exactly one hundred and one thousand dollars worth of materials in our budget, and only buy one hundred and one thousand. Because what happens if you use more materials than you planned on? Well, you have to stop production. So companies often purchase more mater more materials than they actually use during the period. So the journal entry to record the purchase of materials is always very very similar. Raw materials inventory is an asset account. Assets go up on the debit side, so you would debit raw materials inventory for the purchase price. If during 2020, Smart Touch Learning purchased raw materials with $367,000, you would debit raw materials inventory with $367,000. The credit is always for how you are paying for it, and in this case, Smart Touch Learning is paying on account, which means they owe whoever their supplier was for the purchase of these materials. Well, they owe somebody for something that happened in the normal course of operations. That's an accounts payable. So you would credit accounts payable for 367. If, however, they purchase this material in cash, well, again, the credit is always to how you're paying for it. So in that case, you would be paying for in cash. So the credit would be to cash. But debit is always to raw materials inventory. Credit is always to your payment method. And when you purchase raw materials, you keep track of how much of each raw material you have in what they call a subledger, a raw material subsidiary ledger. And you need one of these for each and every raw material that is used in production. So in this case, Smart Touch Learning has STL batteries. And these batteries are going to be given an item number, which is B103. And companies use item numbers because it's easier to input in the system than having to keep typing in different types of batteries. Uh, it's just tracking here. So we have item B103 over here. Well, what happened with B103? Well, during the period on December 5th, they purchased 200 of these, and they purchased them at $55 a piece. That purchase cost in total 11,200 times 55. That would be what was received. And since that was the only amount of batteries they have on their books, it would also be their balance after December 5th. Well, on December 10th over here, somebody came and they requisitioned materials, which means they went to storage and whoever is in charge of overseeing storage made them fill out a piece of paperwork that said, I am taking out these amount of batteries and I'm going to use them for this particular job that I'm doing. That's that direct traceable thing I'm talking about. Now that there's a record, that somebody said, I'm using this amount of raw materials on this particular job. You have a methodology for assigning that directly to the job. So when this person came in, they requisitioned 50 units, 50 of these batteries, uh, and they were they cost $55 a piece for Smart Touch Learning to buy. So 50 batteries at 55 bucks a piece is $2,750 worth of batteries that are being issued 
from raw material storage and being put into production. So they had 200 before this requisition. They just requisitioned 50 out into production, which means they have 150 left in storage. These are $55 batteries. 150 at 55 bucks is 8,250. And then next up on January 14th, another requisition happened. Somebody came in, uh, and this, we're working on one job cost record here. Somebody came in and they requisitioned 15 batteries for use in this job. Well, those batteries cost $55 a piece. 15 times 55 is 825 bucks. So if they had 150 of these batteries in storage and 15 more just got requisitioned into production, they're down to 135 or $55 a piece, which is $7,425 with the batteries left. And this is how companies keep track of their raw materials inventory amounts. At the end of each period, you would see what the total cost of the balance that was remaining is for each and every product. Add them all together. That's your raw materials inventory. So you need one of these subledgers for every single little thing that you use in production, which is going to be directly traceable to the job or the product that is being worked on, which for a large manufacturing firm can literally be hundreds, if not thousands of different raw material subsidiary ledgers. And here is what that requisition form I was talking about looks like. When someone would come in, they would go to whoever is working in storage and say, I need this amount of materials of this particular type to be used in this particular job. So in this case, we're on job 27. These batteries were requisitioned for job 27, making tablets, uh, 15 of them indeed. So they got 15 batteries costing 55 bucks a piece for a total cost of 825. And when this happens, it needs to be dated. It needs to be signed by whoever requested it. Usually the person who's working in storage who requisitions those materials out would also have to sign this document as well to say there's two parties involved. They know the transfer happened and someone didn't actually just come and steal them. Uh, and these requisitions are stored in the system as well so they can track how the costs of inventory are flowing because now since they're requisitioning it, it's no longer a raw material. It's going to be used on a job which is being produced which means it's a work in process. So that is one of the forms of documentation that manufacturing companies use to keep track of the cost flow of their inventory. And when it's used in a particular job, it has to go on that job's job cost record. So our job here is job 27. Uh, and this job in particular is to produce 15 tablets preloaded with accounting e-learning software for Central College Bookstore. And this is the first, we're just starting this job. This is the first time costs have been added to the particular job. So when this requisition happened back here, where else does it have to go? It has to go on the record of how much this job is costing Smart Touch Learning. So on January 14th, they would denote the requisition number, which is 342, and the amount of materials requisition, which again were the 15 batteries at 55 bucks a piece for a total cost of 825. And now we've started tracking costs for job 27 and her job cost record, which means we used materials. And when you use materials in production, they're no longer in storage, but we put them in raw materials inventory when we purchased them earlier. Now we have to take it out and put those costs into work and process. So if it is a direct material, matters a ton in this journal entry. And the reason being is if it's a direct material, it gets to go right into WIP. So in 2020, Smart Touch Learning uses direct materials, which cost $355,000, and indirect materials, which cost $17,000. For those indirect materials, you don't transfer them right into WIP because we don't have a good way of tracing them to each job. Like we wouldn't be able to put them in the job cost record of each specific job, uh, which means we got to find some other way to get them in the jobs because we can't trace them. And that is our manufacturing overhead pool. So we have an indirect, non-traceable cost. We're going to put that in the manufacturing overhead pool. So since 355,000 of those were traceable, we can trace them right to jobs. We would debit work and process inventory, increasing the value of that asset account by that 355,000, the amount that is traceable. And the amount that is untraceable, that $17,000 of indirect materials, that has to go into manufacturing overhead, but we still debit that account. So we have a debit of 355 to WIP, and we have a debit of 17,000 to manufacturing overhead. But in total, we took $372,000 out of storage, out of our raw materials inventory account, which means we have to reduce the value of that account. And raw materials inventory, like all inventory accounts, is an asset. It decreases on the credit side. So we're going to credit raw materials inventory for $372,000.
What about labor when it comes to a job cost record? Well, people go and they punch in. And nowadays, most companies use some kind of electronic system for this. So you'll have uh, a name tag, uh, you know, some kind of ID hanging off a lanyard. You'll scan it. Uh, and when you scan it, the computer is going to make you punch a button to say what job you're working on that day. And it gives you a way to trace the cost of your labor directly to those jobs. There are, however, still companies that use a manual system, those good old punch cards where you slide them into a clock and they click it. And at the end of the period, they have to go and round up those punch cards. Uh, still, the way that you input into those punch cards, it tells you what job you're working on. So it's the same concept. It's just made easier through modern technology. Here on January 15th, somebody within the company started working and assembling these 15 tablets preloaded with accounting e-learning software. And by working on these jobs, they made $90 in wages. Well, when they punched in, they said, I'm working on job 27, those 15 tablets for Central College Bookstore. So now their labor, which is directly traceable to the job, has to go on the job cost record. So on January 15th, you record the labor time record number, which is something the system usually spits out. I'll always give it to you in this class. It's just a way of going back into your records and looking. In this case, it's 236. For the amount that, that particular employee made, during that day while they were specifically working on this job, which in this instance is 90 bucks. So now we have some of our costs into this job. We have the cost of that direct materials requisition. We have the cost of direct labor to put those batteries that we had into these units that we're making. And when you record labor expenses in your books, it works the same way as materials in regards to what's direct and what's indirect. If labor is directly traceable, the people work 